while doing one of my lobsters for this class, there was a video that we had to watch. I got obsessed with it. I just went into a whole rabbit hole about how I could be the person who does that. Welcome to Learning From Experience, a podcast for college students and recent grads who want to hear directly from alumni on how they've adjusted their lives post-graduation, including personal stories of success, career readiness, and tips for navigating the real world, created by the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences at Arizona State University. I'm your host, Megan Finnerty, and today I'm talking with Karen Amos, who graduated from ASU in August of 2022, where she majored in biochemistry. Welcome, Karen. How are you today? Hi, I'm great. Thanks for having me. So talk to me a little bit about what you do now. So right now I work at a fertility clinic um, and I just got started doing embryology work. So I am now a junior embryologist learning the traits of everything to do with embryos, um, eggs, retrievals, transfers, um, IVF, all of the good things, cryopreservation, all of that um, on the embryo side. I have been working for the last few months on the male reproductive side. Um, so looking at sperm samples, prepping them for IVF and IUIs um, and talking to patients about their, their sperm. I'm really excited to talk to you today and hear more about your experience. It sounds really fascinating. Tell me about how you landed at ASU and what led you into working in fertility. So I had a career prior to working in fertility. I was a full-blown teacher. I got a bachelor's in early childhood education, um, and then I pursued a master's in teaching. And then I was teaching for about Two, I was on my third year of teaching. So it's two and a half years um, when I went back to school at ASU. And how I got started on that was I had a student um, who was in a pre-AP class of mine that I was teaching. And he just came to me. Everything that we did, he had a question for it. And I was like, I just don't know the answer to your questions. And I feel like a bad teacher. I'm not, but I feel like a bad teacher because I can't answer your questions because I don't have the background for it. My science education wasn't really great. And so I didn't know how to answer them. And so it's like, if I'm going to be the best teacher possible, I need a better science education. And so I did some research um, and was debating between biology, chemistry, or biochemistry. Um, found out that biochemistry is the perfect fit between biology and chemistry, which makes sense. And so I looked into where I could get a biochemistry degree that was local to me. And I knew that because I had already gotten a couple of degrees, I would not have to take like the, the general ed courses. I would just need the biochemistry courses. However, there are a lot of labs within biochemistry. And the problem that I continued to run into over and over and over and over and over again was that the labs were in the middle of the day, uh, which I could not leave my class for and go take those labs on a Tuesday for four hours at a time and then come back to work. Like that just didn't work. ASU popped up pretty early on and I d ignored it. I didn't think ASU was credible for an online program. And then it ended up like just popping up so often that I was like, fine, I'll look into it and found out that it was a really credible program and they had worked really hard. Um, I talked to some of the admissions people and the advisors, and I was really impressed with the program and how they accommodated online learning to make sure it was as close to on-campus learning as possible and that you didn't lack any of the experiences that an on-campus student had, uh, which was really important to me going into you know, a science field. Um, so then I finally got started. I got accepted January 2020. Um, and I'd been at ASU for about a year. And I took biology, general biology two, bio 182, for those of you guys who know that. Um, and the lab section of that class is what ultimately changed my life forever. Labster, I think, is the greatest invention um, of the modern era. It's absolutely fantastic for doing labs online. And while doing one of my labsters for this class, there was a video that we had to watch. ICSI stands, it's ICSI, which stands for Intracytoplasmic Sperm Injection which is where a super tiny microscopic needle picks up a single sperm and then injects it into an egg. And then you watch it fertilize, become an embryo over the period of five to six days. And then that's when it's either frozen or transferred. So I watched that video over and over and over and over again during that lab. I got obsessed with it. 
I finished the lab work and then I went on YouTube and continued to watch more videos like it. Um, and then I just went into a whole rabbit hole about how I could be the person who does that. And I found out really quickly that that person's called an embryologist. And you didn't need an additional degree, like a master's degree or a PhD, which is super enticing to me as somebody who, you know, I was already going back to school. I was already changing careers. I was already getting another degree. My student loans were hitting the max, getting pretty close to that. And so that was really enticing to me that I could pursue this career path without the additional certification and degrees, um, like some other career options. So ultimately, I continued down that rabbit hole. And I knew that for this kind of work, I would need hands-on experience before I got to the job. And I was like, what opportunities does ASU have and where I can do that? So I looked and other than the labs uh, that you do, so your organic chemistry and biochemistry labs, Dr. Holchek, who's genetics professor at ASU, is an absolutely fantastic woman. She was piloting that summer a online research program. And so the students had done research in the spring online, and then were coming in for a week in the summer to actually conduct their research projects. And so I reached out to her and I was like, Hey, I heard about your pilot program. I want to be in the next cohort. How do I get in? What do I need to do? And she was like, well, what project would you work on? What do you, what would you be researching? And so after a talk about that, uh, she let me in was very excited. Um, and so my project that I proposed was studying the different types of media used for embryo cultivation. Uh, and I was looking at using bovine embryos after figuring out which animal would be the closest to a human for the reproductive tract um, as a study tool. Um, so using the bovine embryos and then cult media specific to those cells. So I did a lot of research on this project. I worked really hard on it. Um, I went in person. I didn't get to get the embryos and work with them specifically, but I did go in person and work with other cells. We grew cell, cell culture lines. Um, and then I eventually presented my project at the Fall Symposium at ASU, which was super nerve wracking, but an incredible experience. Uh, once I did that and I was able to answer people's questions, I felt really confident in my skills and choosing this as a career path. So a few short months later, I began reaching out to local fertility clinics in order to get hired over the summer. And I got a call back. And here we are today. When it came to managing your time, did you have to have hard conversations with your family or your friends or just even make them aware that your schedule was going to be different? Yeah. So there's the triangle that people say that they, you have to pick, you know, two things when you go to college, you can have a social life, you can have sleep or you can have good grades. And I picked sleep and good grades. I was like, I'm not going to have a social life. I'm okay with that. I used the breaks that I had. So I really took advantage of, you know, the four days that you have between sessions. I really took advantage of the time off uh, for winter break and for fall break and all of those periods. I used those, which they lined up with my teaching times off. So that was super convenient. And so I just really like tried to maximize on those and then followed a really strict schedule. So I would work. I actually was working out at that time in the morning before work. So I'd get up really early. I would work out, go teach. Uh, then I would come home, take a nap, get some rest because I needed that mental brain break. And then um, around 9 to 10 o'clock, I would jump into schoolwork until about 2 a.m. And that's kind of just how I lived my life for two years. Having such a strict schedule that you stuck to every day, is that something that you had already a part of your life? Or was that something that at this time you had to develop and adapt? That's definitely something that I had to develop. I didn't have a structure like that prior um, to going to ASU. And without creating that schedule, I would not have been successful. There's no way that I would have been able to get through classes like organic chemistry or calculus too without having a strict routine and making sure I'm following that every day. 
when you're going through this time, what were your conversations like to your friends and to your family saying, Hey, I'm really busy. Yeah. I had to be really upfront with them and like, Hey, I'm pursuing this degree and it's biochemistry. And they're like, as soon as you say biochemistry, people are like, Oh man. And I'm like, I'm not going to med school. I'm not pre-med, but it is going to be taking a lot of my time. So if I don't text you back, just know that you know I'm working on other things. I'll get back to you when I have time. And just making sure that I found other ways to still be involved with friends and family and still make sure that they knew I was around. Um, and I still loved them without you know as much time as I had been giving them previously. When you're making that transition from education into a more direct healthcare science field, what kind of transferable skills did you find out that you had? Yeah. So I focused on four specific skills when I was navigating that change. Number one, leadership. I received scholarships. I um, worked on multiple teams as part of being a teacher. I coached a robotics program as a teacher. And so leadership is really important. And you lead a whole class, multiple classes, depending on the grade. And so leadership was a really big skill that I had developed. And that translates really well into any workplace that you go into, being able to work with multiple types of different people. But in the fertility environment, it's especially important because of the high stakes and the high emotions that we deal with on a daily basis. Um, There's a lot of money that people put into this, a lot of time and a lot of emotional investment. And you have to be able to be flexible and meet people where they're at. And that, that's a leadership skill. So that's one. The second one is being a confident communicator. So I've done public speaking for a lot of different things. I competed in pageants during my first, first couple degrees. Uh, so I got experience speaking on stage there. I did the fall symposium that I talked about earlier, where I presented my project in front of a bunch of ASU students, uh, which was really nerve wracking. Um, and then I've also gotten awards for the curriculum that I've done uh, as a teacher, uh, just writing that. So that's number two. Number three is being focused on the individual. So with teaching, hopefully you know this as a student or you know having been a student at any point in your life, you want that one-to-one connection with your teacher. You want to be able to build that bond and that relationship, and that's going to propel your, your success. That is true in healthcare work as well. So making sure that, you know, the patient feels seen and heard and they feel understood and not like they are just, you know, another dollar sign walking in our door. So that was another really important skill. Um, And I actually like worked really hard on developing that specifically in healthcare when I was at ASU because I picked up a weekend job uh, working at Walgreens doing pharmacy tech work so that I could get more experience working directly with patients. And so because because I did that, I was able to, you know, help manage that transition and help to see and understand more of where patients are coming from and their frustrations. And then the last one is technology. So technology is the life. There are so many different technology devices that we have and so many different software programs that we use. And being able to use those and be familiar with them or be able to adapt and learn to them um, is something that I definitely had to do teaching especially when I transferred states teaching. So I taught in Arkansas for a little bit and then I moved to Tennessee and they used an entirely different grading system. They used brand new software that I had never used before. And then getting into the science field where we used things like infrared spectroscopy, which was really hard to pronounce when I first started. And so like learning how to do those things and being able to transfer my skills of technology. And if something doesn't work, then what do I do? Like, how do I figure out how it works? in a technology sense. Now that you've been working in the field of fertility, what's it been like for you? It's been really fun and exciting. I think the most rewarding part is being able to give patients an answer as to why. Sometimes with fertility, we don't know why um, or we feel like we're going crazy because of all the hormones and everything that's happening in our body. And there's not a visual answer. Like, you don't have a broken leg. So you're not like walking around on crutches. It's really hard to identify like, why am I not getting pregnant? And being able to give patients that answer and a solid answer and explain to them the different steps and processes that we have to help them reach their goals 
of creating whatever family they desire. That's so rewarding and just like fills my heart with so much joy. I think it's beautiful because you're helping people with a dream that they have and also going through really tough times. I think sometimes fertility is like a taboo topic. So far since you've been working in this industry, have you noticed that kind of bleed into your work? So that is definitely something that I have a lot of experience with, especially because I work with sperm. And guys typically tend to believe that there's nothing wrong with their sperm. And, you know, there's this belief in society that if there are fertility problems, it's the woman. And 50% of the time, it's actually not the woman, it's a male factor. And so that's really interesting to find out. And then Whenever patients come in, our male patients come into the office, they're definitely a little squeamish um, going into the collection room. And, you know, whenever I explain things to them about the process of, you know, the right way to collect, because there is a right way, like we don't want, you know, a bunch of bacteria to get in it or you'd accidentally kill it, um, things like that. And so there's definitely like patients are squeamish. Um I've definitely become more open in talking about things like that, sperm, eggs, embryos, the whole reproductive process. And I've definitely noticed that, you know, on I post about it on my social media because it's really cool. It's really fascinating. And um, there are a lot of things that people respond to and they're like, wow, I had no clue. Or like, thank you so much for sharing that. Like your story has inspired me in this way. And there are friends that I have who have, you know, gotten fertility treatments because of some of the stuff that I've shared online because they just didn't know before. It's not talked about enough and it's definitely not included included in sex education in America. What do you see as the future of the field? And would you encourage students today to look into it just like you did? Absolutely. So there's an estimated 10 to 20% growth in the next 10 years for this field, uh, for reproductive sciences in general. So whether that's on the clinic side, looking at like nurses or reproductive endocrinologists, which are the doctors behind fertility, or even on the lab side with andrologists and embryologists, like like the work that I do, um, there's a lot of growth. And honestly, there's a lot of money in it. Um, as soon as I'm fully trained in, in embryology, I can make up to you know, with two years of experience, just looking at two years of experience, I can be starting at um, 150 at a brand new clinic. Um, anywhere from I've seen clinics post all the way up to 180 for just being fully trained. So what you were saying earlier is that this is a field that you can get into with only a bachelor's degree. And it looks like, you know, you're just saying it's a growing field with a lot of growth potential, even monetarily. What would those undergraduate degrees be in? It's a bachelor's degree in biology, chemistry, or biochemistry, or another life science. So a lot of people who are pre-vet um, could also consider this as a field too. So looking back at your education here at ASU, and now your experience in the field, what have you learned from experience? I think the biggest thing is a motto that the ASU Ideas Society is founded on which is collaboration, not competition. You can't do anything alone. You can't, you can't treat a patient. You can't study for a final. You, I mean, you can, but your chances of being successful are going to be astronomically higher when you have others around you and when you're working with them, not against them. Well, Karen, thank you so much for coming on this podcast and sharing about the fertility industry and your experience in it also about transferable skills and time management. For anyone that would like to connect with Karen, you can connect with her on social media. Her Instagram and Facebook handles are both the same. They're at Karen Amos 027. And then to hear more alumni advice, head to our episode page wherever you listen to podcasts. Check out the college's YouTube channel or visit thecollege.asu.edu slash LFE podcast. See you next time.